Good day. Hey, it's really good to be here with you. And thank you so much for welcoming me into your places and spaces and radios and TVs. And I'm probably saying too much about that. But anyways, thank you so much. And uh, just so great to be here with you. And I hope you've had a, a wonderful summer and had time to travel a little bit and visit family maybe and people you haven't seen. Uh, in a long time, uh, over the last couple of years, that's been hard to do. And today I just want to say to you that we're, we're moving into a new uh, sermon series. We're going to be in the book of Daniel for, who knows, four, five, six, seven weeks. I'm not quite sure yet. So maybe you would uh, take some time over the next uh, day or so, and week or so, or however you want to do it, and open up that book of Daniel and read through it. It's a marvelous book. It's not the easiest book to understand, but it's certainly, certainly very relevant to uh, what uh, we're going to be talking about during this sermon series. You can look for it on our Facebook page, uh, Redwater Alliance, our YouTube channel, Redwater Alliance, even our website, redwateralliancechurch.org. You can find it there. Um, so why don't we just start? Let's dig right in here. Trevin Wax... Uh, in his blog, presents what he believes are the four biggest challenges facing evangelicals in the 21st century. And I think this is going to be pertinent for, our, for the message today, so it's a bit of a long introduction. So let's take a look at these challenges. And he would go on to suggest that these challenges are not coming from some um, oppressive government or tyranny, but the challenges that the 21st century church is facing today is, are subtle. And they found their way into the church under the radar, alongside what he calls our cultural learnings. Number one, we live in a culture captivated by what Trevin calls expressive individualism. Expressive individualism. So our culture's greatest commandment is, according to Trevin, be you. Be true to yourself. Now, of course, you've probably heard that. Maybe someone said that to you. But this overemphasized individualism challenges the church because the Holy Bible, from beginning to end, stresses the us over the me. And the collective us is under a sovereign God. And then you add to this overemphasized individualism the Western belief about freedom and happiness. We are, we are left with a strong push against any claim to a moral authority over the individual. And instead of fulfilling our God-given purpose of glorifying God and enjoying Him forever, the culture stresses and demands what uh, Trevin suggests here, that the chief end of religion is to glorify man so he can enjoy himself forever. And secondly, Trevin goes on to suggest that we have a pragmatic view of faith in God. Simply put, our faith is to be lived only in the private space of our personal values, morals, ethics, and spiritual virtues. Faith and practice are inward, not outward. Faith is in the personal space, not the public space. And of course, many, it seems today, who call themselves evangelical believers see their faith as a means to an end. That is, how their faith impacts their lives inwardly and privately only. But Trevin's point is this, that when Christianity is privatized, the very nature of what is good changes. The very nature of what is good changes. There's no standard outside of ourselves, in other words. No objective moral truth outside of our own private personal faith. God is not a life to be lived with, but a reward to be attained. And you know, you can take a look around and you will see many evangelicals today treating their faith in God simply as another road to consumerism. In other words, what can I get out of it now for me? What value is it for me? Thirdly, Trevin goes on, and, and, and this is certainly clear to me. Today, there's a greater and growing number who view Christian morality and teachings not only as old-fashioned, but downright dangerous. And for some evangelicals responding to this from the culture, 
they attempt to keep their distance from those Christians, those evangelicals, who are not so winsome and who frankly are rather persuasive, to put it that way, in their approach to the culture. They try to avoid that. And Trevin would suggest that these evangelicals would say, why can't we all be nice like Rick Warren? And then people will be able to see how reasonable the teachings of the Bible really are. Well, friends, these nice evangelicals forget that the culture today is in the middle of a moral, ethical, and spiritual revolution. Fourthly, people today are increasingly becoming isolated. That's clear to see in our culture. And as Trevin writes, not only isolated, but fragmented and polarized. He goes on to suggest that the 21st century, like any other time in history, has revealed a large and growing public distrust in institutions. I think this is very evident today, yeah, certainly in Canada, United States, and really in the West. And as a result of this, many have become disoriented and fragmented. So you have more and more isolation, then you have a greater disorientation and fragmentation, which is occurring in the culture. And then Trevin goes on to say, you add this to a greater polarization, the division, which is, according to him, exponentially affected by the internet and social media. All these are great challenges to the church in the 21st century. Now, you might ask, how? Well, consider this. Many evangelicals today participate in church primarily to seek some personal fulfillment and affirmation. Not so much to become uh, godly husbands or godly fathers or a good and godly neighbor or any other moral, ethical, or spiritual virtue. Not so much for that. And it's not the hard to see that under the big evangelical tent of the 21st century, there are many so-called Christian leaders willing to give what evangelicals are looking to consume. A better life now, a personal fulfillment and affirmation, which frankly, in the end, will lead them down a path of disillusionment and hopelessness when faced with the reality of a sinful and broken world. So please now turn into your Bibles there to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to read the whole chapter. Originally, I was only going to read 8 to 21, but we want to read the whole chapter. It's not very long, uh, and let's read that together. So Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of Jehoiakim, king of Judea, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. He brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish of good appearance, and skillful, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. 
Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. At the end of the ten days it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in the flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Verse 17. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And at the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this story that we have before us in the book of Daniel. And we ask you, O Holy Spirit, to help us understand the implications of that in our time. But Lord, also help us to understand your word in a way that brings you the glory that you deserve. Help us not to put ourselves in there. Help us not to change it. Help us to understand it and to put it into practice. We pray all this in the wonderful and great and wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as we begin to engage with the book of Daniel, there is great value in remembering the cardinal rule of understanding any biblical text. Context, context, context. And I really challenge you and myself to resist the temptation to read ourselves into the text. Here in the book of Daniel, we ask that we have to understand that we are not Daniel. And that the events that the Bible has revealed to us here in our text today occurred approximately 2,600 years ago. Everything about this story is for the most part foreign to the everyday 21st century believer. We also must resist in these first 21 verses to use a metaphor to allegorize and make some sort of sense to make some sort of sense of the text before us. For our text here in chapter 1 is historic narrative presented in story form. And in these 21 verses, it tells us quite a lot about what happened to the nation of Judah, to the city of Jerusalem, to the temple and the people of Jerusalem around the year 605 B.C. But more importantly than all of this, we must remember that the book of Daniel is the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God. It has its place in the context of the whole book, the Bible. It has its specific purposes for Daniel's day. And because of the nature and genre of some of this book, it stretches beyond into the end time when Jesus returns. But overall, the theme is what we need to remember as we move on. That from chapter 1 to the end of chapter 12, we see the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. Friends, God is sovereign over all the nations of the world. Even though it might not feel like it. And we find here in the time of Judah, for it was God who said that if Judah did not repent and turn back to him, he would send them into captivity for 70 years. You see, God was sovereign in the time of Judah and Babylon. And God is sovereign today in our time, and God is sovereign always. And it is in God's sovereign purposes that he's planned a day to come, a day of judgment, what the Bible calls the day of the Lord, for the unrepented wicked person. And God has put in place his plan, his plan of redemption for those who have put their trust and faith in him. So folks, this is the overarching and prominent theme of the book of Daniel. Let's always keep that in mind, not try to get all messed up with all the different things that we see in this book. Reflecting back on Trevin Wax's blog, it certainly reminds us of the challenges that we face as Christians in the 21st century. 
Clearly, we live in a culture that is, for the most part, pagan, as you can get. There's this idea, still floating around, that many years ago, a nation or a culture could have been called Christian, or more Christian than today, for example. Now, whether you subscribe to this or not is, in reality, mute. Because today, the church is faced with a culture that increasingly sees the church as the enemy. It is an ungodly world that we live in as followers of Christ. So let's not become sentimental and reminisce about those good old days when the church were, was friends with the pagan culture. It won't do us any good at all today. The better question to ask is the one that Pastor Alistair Begg asks. What does it look like to live as a Christian in a society that increasingly does not like what Christians believe, what we say, and how we live. As we look at Daniel, we see that the contrast is self-evident. <coughs> Pardon me. Daniel and his friends throughout the story are portrayed as faithful, God-fearing Jews, and indeed, they are faithful, God-fearing Jews. They were literally taken as hostages to Babylon, the epicenter of the political power of the day, the center of the worship of pagan gods. And as we consider this story from the comfort of our chairs or couches or wherever we are, surrounded by family and friends, it is indeed hard to imagine the pressure that Daniel and his friends came under and pressure they came under to conform. So we're looking at verse 1 to 7. We see that the Babylonians were intending on taking the young Daniel and converting him fully into a faithful follower of the Babylonian gods and the Babylonian culture. Daniel and the others taken into captivity were the cream of the crop. They were young and impressionable. They were probably in their teenage years. They were taken from the nation of Judah. They would be educated in literature and the language and religion of the Chaldeans. We see this in verse 4. We see that this indoctrination because that's what this was, included even the food they would eat and even the names they would bear. You know, there used to be this cute kids jingle used in the church with the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But do you know what those names really mean? Changing names, you see, was part of the indoctrination of Daniel into the Babylonian culture and faith. Verse 7 tells us that Daniel's name, which means God is my judge, was changed to Belshazzar, which means Bel protects the king. Bel was a Babylonian god. Hananiah, which means the Lord is gracious, was changed to Shadrach, which means command of Aku. Now Aku was another of the Babylonian gods. Mishael, which means who is the Lord, to Meshach, which means who is what me, pardon me, who is what Aku is? Not, again, the Babylonian God. And Azariah, which means the Lord is my helper, to Abednego, which means servant of Nego. Now, Nego was the Babylonian God of vegetation. Now, maybe that cute kid's jingle wouldn't seem so cute if you were Daniel and his three faithful friends. You see, they were under extreme pressure to conform to the ba ba pagan Babylonian culture. Excuse me, I have to take a drink. So the question that was before Daniel and his friends is the question that you and I are faced with today. Uh, when do we draw the line in the sand? When do we draw the line in the sand? You know, the line that says to the culture, here's where I make my stand for Christ. I will not cross over whatever befalls me. No matter what comes my way, I make my stand here. You know, we need to be reminded what the Apostle John said. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, what does the world offer? What does the world love? Well, John tells us. 
It offers the desires of the flesh. It desires of the eyes, the pride of life. It loves the desires of the flesh, loves the desires of the eyes, desires of the eyes, pardon me, loves the pride of life. See, friends, none of this is from a holy, just, and loving God. You see, it's also, it's, pardon me, it's always a battle of the wills, isn't it? Our sinful wills or God's righteous will. And John, again, reminds us that this world is passing away. What this world desires are passing away. You know, while they're passing away, God's will abides forever. You know, friends, you can ignore God. You can do whatever you want. That's your choice. You can go to church all your life if you want. And never once consider the will of God for your life that is discovered in his holy word. Yet one day it will pass away. But God's will remains forever. Well, back to our text. So what did Daniel do when the will of the Babylonian king was literally forced on him? Well, let's, let's read together verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Daniel purposed that he would not defile himself. Please notice how Daniel did this. It seems he was okay with three years of education and language training, but with the king's food, he drew the line in the sand. Daniel would go no further. Keep in mind, at this time, remember this is not the Christian era, the Jewish dietary laws were an integral part of the worship of God. God commanded certain things to eat and not to eat. And the Babylonians would offer food and drink to their gods, offer up food and drink to their gods. And this is where Daniel drew the line in the sand. Whereas Pastor Beg said to Daniel at this point, this is faithful living in an ungodly surroundings, otherwise known as the Christian life, he would say. Now let me ask, if it was at all possible, where would you have drawn the line if you were in Daniel's situation? And let's be reminded what the Apostle Peter said. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. You will find this in 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 and 2. (coughs) I've got a dry throat here, folks. Pardon me. Daniel, you see, allowed himself to be educated and he allowed himself to serve the Babylonian king. And I don't think he did that, uh, you know, happily necessarily all the time. But he refused to eat the Babylonian food. And much later in life, Daniel, you will see this in chapter 6, he would refuse to stop praying in plain view of all. And for that he was thrown in the den of lions. So let me ask you, where do we draw the line? Well, clearly, when the Word of God tells us what to do, we obey our King Jesus. But sometimes there is less clarity, isn't there? So where do we draw the line when it's not so clear? You see, for Daniel, the Word of God was clear. You don't eat or drink any food offered to false gods and idols. But yet when he was faced with the pressure to stop praying for a certain amount of time, he refused. That was different, wasn't it? Why? Well, Pastor Beg again helps us. Beg goes on to say, Daniel was facing direct intimidation, and he was, and he refused to bow before it. The edict the king made was not aimed at the public good, but at the exaltation of his name above God's. And Daniel drew the line at giving the impression that he was in agreement with the edict and that his allegiance to God came second to his obedience to the king. So when should we draw the line? Well, the line is drawn very obviously when we are told to disobey God. We don't, we draw the line there if someone tells us to disobey God. 
But the line can also be drawn when a Christian is asked to compromise on a matter that of their conscience, which tells them crossing over will compromise their identity as Christians. And here's the point. If this is the case, we should, be rem- we should remember to prayfully seek God's wisdom where to draw the lines when it isn't so clear. And a good place to find this much-needed wisdom, of course, is in the Scriptures. And we can go to the New Testament, for example. Romans 13 commands us to submit to the governing or- or authorities. For Paul said this, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. And yet, if you go to Acts chapter 4 and 5, we find God's people, they're refusing to obey the governing authorities. The apostle John and Peter were arrested and commanded to stop preaching the good news of Jesus Christ from the governing authorities. But they refused to obey. Well, we could say that 2020 and 2021 were difficult years for the world, but certainly difficult also for Christians and the church for a variety of reasons. And most certainly difficult when it came to deciding when to obey the authorities or not concerning their decisions over churches during the pandemic. Again, that throat is so dry. Pardon me, back on track. I'm sure you have your own opinions over what transpired when churches in Canada and in our neighbor, the U.S., refused to obey the governing authorities concerning church closures. In particular, California imposed severe limitations on churches. In similar fashion, this all also occurred in Scotland. Both California and Scotland ordering churches not to gather at all. So when we consider Daniel and the, and the New Testament, we can say that these kinds of restrictions were most likely in Acts 4 and 5 situation, and the line needed to be drawn right there. Here in Alberta, if you're from Alberta, you remember this, after the initial precautionary closures, the churches were allowed to gather for worship as long as when they gathered, masks were worn and people kept their distance. And we here at Redwater Alliance submitted to this mandate for a scene more like a Romans 13 situation. But this brings us back to the question Pastor Big asked at the beginning. What does it look like to live as a Christian in a society that does not like what Christians believe, what we say, and how we live? Well, the answer, I hope, is apparent to you as we've been looking ever so briefly at this first chapter of Daniel, we live like Daniel lived before God. And I want you to hear Daniel, God's prophet, from the pages of God's holy word. God is in control. God is sovereign over the nation. God keeps all his promises, for they are yes in Christ Jesus. You see, God, the decider of all things, will either choose to deliver you and me from the storm, or he will deliver you and me through the storm. Hear the Apostle Paul from the pages of God's holy word. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friends, there will be one moment to come. It will be like the twinkle of an eye. And then God, the scripture tells us, will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. What a day that will be, my friends. What a day that will be. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, so much for your word. Thank you so much for the faithfulness of your servant Daniel and his faithful friends. As an example for us, how to live 
a godly life in an ungodly world. I pray we take this to heart and mind, that we take it to our knees and we pray, and then we are faced with those decisions, you would give us the wisdom, the courage, and the strength either to draw the line in the sand or not fight that battle because it's not worth dying on. But where we need to draw the line in the sand, Lord, give us that strength and that courage to know that you are with us and you'll bring us through it. And we thank you so much for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Shalom.